Dr. Merchant is joining us today uh, from the Boys Town National Research Hospital, where she's currently the director of the Translational Auditory Physiology and Perception Lab. She initially obtained a PhD at Harvard and MIT, where her dissertation focused on developing non-invasive diagnostic methods to differentiate between various conductive hearing pathologies, followed um, by a um, doctorate in audiology at UMass Amherst. Her current research is focused on improving the differential diagnosis of otitis media in children, and she was kind enough to give us a grand rounds today. Well, thank you very much for that introduction, and thank you guys for having me. I'm excited to have an opportunity to share some of um, the recent work from my lab uh, with this audience. So as my introduction implies, I'm not an otologist or a neurotologist, but my work um, as an audiologist and a hearing scientist has often kind of stood at this intersection of audiology um, and otology, I think, because of my interest in conductive hearing loss and in mechanical pathologies that pathologies of the ear and how we can improve their diagnosis. And so I'm hoping that there's something um, that you all find interesting in this today. So today I'm going to focus mostly on our work on um, improving how we diagnose the hearing loss that's associated with variations in otitis media in children um, with a primary focus on a diagnostic tool called wideband acoustic emittance that we have found particularly useful in OM, but also in other mechanical pathologies of the ear. And so I'll touch on that. So this work was motivated actually during an experience that I had during my clinical training as an audiologist while I was working on a pediatric ENT clinic. And I saw three children back to back in clinic that gave me um, some pause. So the first patient was um, a three-year-old who came in, you know, when I do otoscopy, I'm just looking for, you know, any gross abnormalities, um, any signs that I shouldn't be putting maybe a probe in their ear, things like that. And so I look in their ear, nothing jumped out at me as atypical did a tympanogram, which I'm gonna assume some level of familiar familiarity with kind of our basic um, clinical diagnostic audiology tool. So looking at that eardrum mobility, it was flat, um, consistent with probably some middle ear fusion. And then this child was great, conditioned great to behavioral audiometry. And we saw a pretty notable air bone gap in that ear suggesting a moderate conductive hearing loss. Um, a child came in right after him, same kind of presentation, grossly normal otoscopy, flat tympanogram, but thresholds um, didn't condition quite as good as the first child. So this child was a little bit younger, um, but the thresholds that we got suggested normal to near normal hearing. And so I already have some pause here. Why does the first child have this moderate amount of conductive hearing loss, whereas this second child um, seems to be hearing kind of within what we consider the normal hearing range? And then a third child came in right after 22 months old, um, probably in my mind, one of the toughest ages to test because they're kind of between some of our strategic techniques to test behaviorally, grossly normal otoscopy, flat tympanogram, and would not condition to any behavioral testing. So in this scenario, I'm wondering, how is this child hearing? The first child with a very similar presentation had this moderate conductive hearing loss. Um, the second child had pretty normal hearing. And so really based on that, I have no idea how this child's hearing in this scenario. And does that matter? Should we be considering hearing loss as we think about kind of the diagnosis and management of this condition. So that set me on a hunt into the literature and I realized that there were still um, a number of unanswered questions in this area. So um, we know that otitis media has many forms. There's lots of variability. You can have um, infection, you can have um, a fusion of various viscosities and amounts. Um, and so there's just lots of variability. And we don't have a ton of great knowledge about how all these variables might be related. So how these effusion characteristics like volume, viscosity, and presence of infection might impact how much hearing loss a child has from a given episode, and also how they may influence the prognosis and resolution. So are there certain characteristics of effusions that drive um, an effusion to persist versus resolve spontaneously? And so in turn, we don't really know which of these variables might be important to consider for management and in turn, how we identify and measure them if they are important. So we have some really nice clinical practice guidelines that kind of take advantage of everything we do have diagnostically um, at our fingertips at this point. But the question really is, is there additional evidence that we could be obtaining that could be useful beyond, beyond what we kind of already have suggested in the clinical practice guidelines, more information about some of these effusion characteristics, if indeed they seem to be important to either hearing loss, prognosis, or these factors. 
Um, and then ultimately, long term, I'm really interested in whether some of this variability um, influences whether a child has any long term behavioral or otherwise consequences of otitis media. So there's pretty equivocal evidence in the clinical literature, but much more definitive evidence in the animal literature that a history of transient conductive hearing loss, particularly during critical developmental periods, may lead to deficits in things like binaural processing and even speech and language. Um, we don't have a great grasp on that, I think, in the clinical literature because we've often been lumping kids together who likely have different amounts of hearing loss over different periods of time, and we just don't have kind of that very fine-grained longitudinal um, data on their auditory status over time. So these are kind of the big picture questions that um, this body of work has been trying to better understand. Okay, so the data that I'm gonna share today um, is primarily looking at children who have been diagnosed with otitis media with effusion in our otolaryngology clinics, and we're scheduled to have tubes placed. Um, they average around 34 months of age. We pretty much took any pediatric patient, but um, I'm sure it won't surprise you all that this skewed pretty kind of on that lower end. And so what we do is if they are diagnosed with OME um, in the ENT clinic, we invite them to enroll in the study, and then we try to bring them into the lab. Um, usually within 24 hours of their two placement surgery. I like to be as close to surgery as possible, um, but all of these participants at least came in within 48 hours of surgery. And then we make repeated measurements on the morning of surgery um, in the pre-op um, patient room just to confirm that the middle ear status has, um, at least by all our metrics, not changed. And then we characterize several variables related to their individual case of otitis media during surgery. Um, you'll see some age batch normal hearing control participants who have no recent history of otitis media in the last 12 months. And in this case, all of the children that were in this study had sensory neural hearing loss ruled out. So they either had normal bone conduction thresholds um, and or otoacoustic emissions at some point in the study. And so we're looking at pure conductive hearing losses here um, just to kind of keep things clean initially. So this is just kind of an overview of what the protocol for most of these data involved. So they had that initial visit in the lab that took one to two hours, um, again, within 48 hours of tube placement. And during that visit, we did a bunch of kind of standard clinical measurements and then a few kind of research variations of these. So we did behavioral audiometry, air and mass bone conduction. We try to get as much your specific information as we possibly can. We take lots of breaks. We always have two testers. We have very skilled pediatric audiologists. So we kind of have every advantage we possibly could. We do otoacoustic emissions, standard emittance, um, standard tympanometry. Um, and then we also do a kind of more advanced version of um, emittance measurements called wideband acoustic emittance. I'm sorry if you can hear my son crying. My kids are homesick from school today. So <laughs> we're making it work. Um, and I'll talk about why band acoustic events in a minute. Um, on the day of surgery, we see them in pre-op and repeat the wideband and the tympanometry to try to um, confirm that there's been no change in middle ear status. Um, and then we also have been doing some tympanometry pre and post myringotomy. We we're trying to get at some measures of volume of the effusion um, and that hasn't panned out as well as we thought, but we were doing it as part of the protocol. Um, pre and post myringotomy, the um, surgeon who's operating describes the effusion as either mucoid, um, serous, or purulent. And then after the myringotomy, when they are suctioning a bit, we do collect some of that effusion to try to quantify more objectively the volume, viscosity, and purulence. And then the protocol involves bringing them back to the lab a month after surgery to repeat all the testing from the initial visit and kind of see that if there was hearing loss, it's popped back up. Um, I'm not going to show any of the post-op data today for the sake of time, um, but we are doing that. So the one measurement that I'm going to assume less or no familiarity with in this group is wideband acoustic emittance. So as I mentioned, this is kind of a more comprehensive variation of our standard emittance measurements. So our standard emittance measurements, tympanometry, are made in response to single frequency pure tones. Usually these are very low frequency pure tones, around 226 hertz, um, that provide us information in that case really about the stiffness effects of the underlying mechanics. In contrast, these wideband measurements are nice because they provide information about the wideband mechanical effects. So we're looking at effects of stiffness, mass, the resonance, things like that. Um, and so they give us a more, much more comprehensive picture of kind of what's happening mechanically um, in the ear across frequency, but they're made very similar to tympanometry measurements. So we actually use the same device as what um, a lot of clinics are probably using for their standard tympanometry. Um, primarily the Interacoustics Titan, there is another device now on the market um, that does both tympanometry and wideband measurements, the GSI TimpStar. 
Um, and so you put the probe in the ear and you can do this at ambient pressure or in a pressurized state, um, but you play a wide band stimulus, usually a click or a chirp. And you look at, I put this amount of stimulus in, how much was reflected back. And really what we're measuring in the probe is just what percentage of that sound we put in was reflected back at each frequency. And we kind of transform that into um, something we call absorbent. So instead of looking on the graph at what was reflected, we infer what therefore was absorbed into the system. And so when you see these absorbance measurements, what you're looking at is the portion of the energy that was absorbed by the ear over frequencies, different frequencies. And while I'm gonna focus on um, the effects of um, different kind of variations in otitis media on these wide band measurements today. I just did want to highlight particularly for this group that there's been a lot of diagnostic utility of wide band acoustic admittance shown in the literature to date, both in human patients and cadaveric temporal bones um, in different computational models across a wide range of different mechanical pathologies. And so um, I do think we are going to see this more being done in audiology clinics and in turn kind of being um, provided as diagnostic information to um, referring providers in otolaryngology and neurotology. And so these are just some examples of different um, wide band responses <clears throat> that you might see with some given pathologies. And so what you see on these graphs is here's that percentage from zero to 100, zero meaning nothing was absorbed at that frequency, 100 meaning everything was absorbed at that frequency. And then this is kind of a crossed frequency here from 250 to around 8,000 Hertz. And so you can see some normative ranges here. There are age-related norms. We know the mechanical characteristics of the ear change with age, especially in those very younger years. So you do need to use age match norms for comparison and those are all built into the devices. Um, but this is one example of middle ear effusion. And so you can see how there's kind of broad reduction across frequency. And we're gonna talk a lot more about that today. You can see the effect of negative pressure primarily at the lower frequencies, stiffening the eardrum. Um, tubes seem to have these resonances that pop up and actually I often see them even lower than this. Otosclerosis is primarily a stiffening um, effect, so you see this in the low frequencies, whereas discontinuity, um, you see kind of this resonance peak come up, usually around this kilohertz. And interestingly, we even see kind of these resonances pop up with superior semicircular canal dehiscence, which is an inner ear pathology that can cause a conductive hearing loss and changes some of the mechanics. So what you're seeing here really is that you have this hole now, this third window in the inner ear. And so the stapes can move a little bit easier. There's less load there um, because now you have two kind of pressure release valves. And so you're getting a little increased mobility um, at the stapes foot plate. So you're starting to see a little resonance pop up there. Um, and so these wideband measurements do seem to be um, more diagnostically sensitive than kind of our traditional standard tympanometry um, at differentiating different types of hearing loss um, or different causes of conductive hearing loss. <clears throat> okay, so back to the otitis media work. So I often get questions more from the audiology side of things, so it's probably less interesting to this audience of how we collect the effusion. Um, and many of you are probably familiar with this tool, but this is a Jun Tim tap. And so basically this just attaches to the suction um, device. And so the um, operating surgeon can kind of place this near the meringotomy and some of that effusion comes up and drops into this um, little trap here. And I can then pull up that effusion in a micro pipette. And we have this um, micro viscometer, which we were really excited about when we got it. And so it can very accurately quantify um, the how much fluid or how much effusion is in that micro pipette um, on a microliter scale. Um, and it also pushes it through a microfluidic chamber, which we thought would tell us something about the viscosity. The downside to these quantifications has been kind of twofold. So one, um, these effusions have turned out to be very non-homogenous. And I guess that shouldn't surprise me after thinking it through, but you know, the um, effusions have kind of varying viscosity. Like when I explain this to some of my audiology colleagues, I think about, you know, if you have a, a sinus infection or something, you blow your nose and you look at kind of the result. Um, there's kind of areas that are very highly viscous and areas that kind of are thinner in the secretions. And so as we're pushing these effusions through these microfluidic chambers, it's saying high viscosity, lower viscosity, high. So we get these really poor reliability readings and we're not really sure, um, you know, do we take some average over time or what? Um, in addition, when it comes to the volume, what we found is that we certainly aren't going to be able to suction um, all of the effusion out of that space um, and out of the, you know, kind of air cell space. And so um, 
we're not able to quantify exactly how much food was in there. And as it turns out, it doesn't seem to matter so much mechanically what the absolute volume of the effusion was, but rather what kind of that is in comparison to the middle ear cavity size. So is the ear completely full of effusion or partially full? So ultimately what you'll see is that we um, relied more on the subjective quantifications of how full is the ear? Do we see ev any evidence of air? Um, and is it more mucoid or more serous or purulent? So of all these children who had this diagnosis of OME in clinic and enrolled in the study, there was a gap um, of five to 57 days between when they kind of enrolled in the study and when they got surgery. And that's just based on surgery scheduling and kind of um, how busy things are and also just family preferences. Um, some of the kids would get sick. You know, they'd have such surgery scheduled two weeks later, they'd get sick and it would get postponed. So there's quite a bit of variability in the length of time between kind of when they were enrolled and when they actually had surgery. Um, but in the cohort as a whole, um, once they got to surgery, 61% of the ears still had a fusion at the time of surgery, while 39% of ears no longer had a fusion. And so we couldn't really quantify anything in that case about their effusion. And so we call these ears clear ears um, to distinguish them from healthy ears where there's no recent history of OM. So even though there's no effusion in place, we're kind of acknowledging that there's still this very recent history of otitis media that got them to kind of the OR to begin with. And then of the 61% um, of ears that still had a fusion in place, um, we looked at the volume and viscosity of these ears. And so for volume, 61% um, of those ears were completely full. So the surgeon spends quite a bit of um, extra time looking to see if there's any evidence of air um, in that middle ear space, bubbles, et cetera. And so in 61% of cases, they said, nope, there's absolutely no evidence of air. And in 39% of cases, there was evidence of at least some air. And this could be anywhere from like a little bit full to almost completely full with a few air bubbles. Um, as we kind of grow this population, we will look at um, whether the amount kind of in that partial category also affects things. But for the sake of the data I'm sharing today, we've lumped all those partial effusions together. In contrast to volume, where we had some good variability, viscosity was far less variable. So almost every ear was classified ultimately as a mucoid effusion. Um, there were, I think, two serous ears and a purulent ear. Um, and so we really haven't had the statistical power to investigate viscosity. Um, and as you'll see, the effects of volume are so large that um, I'm starting to wonder, at least on hearing loss, whether viscosity probably plays much of a role. Um, I am suspicious it plays a role in prognosis. And so we're still very interested in it, um, particularly because I wonder if that's why we're seeing so many mucoid effusions is that that is some effect of these either effusions that persist or what happens when an effusion persists. So more to come there. All right, so we're gonna start looking at some of the outcome measures that we have been investigating. And again, we're primarily looking at this variable of effusion volume. So we've classified those ears as either full, partial or clear and compared them to those age match normal controls. And so the first thing we're gonna look at is the behavioral audiogram. Um, and these are the average air conduction threshold um, across these different um, children who had these different kind of quantifications of volume. And so what you see here is that the kids that are walking around with those moderate hearing losses are those kids that have those completely full effusions. Where in contrast, if there's any really evidence of air in their middle ear cavity, the transmission of sound is quite resilient. So we're able to get some decent sound transmission if there's even a little bit of ear, air in that middle ear cavity space. In fact, those partial effusions as a group um, were not statistically significantly different from the clear ears that had no fluid um, at the time of uh, surgery. However, both of those groups were poorer than the age match normative controls. And so even though they're kind of on that borderline of what we consider normal, I do think it's kind of interesting that they still are hearing poorer than their um, kind of age matched peers without that recent history of otitis media. And I suspect that some of this hearing loss is because of residual inflammation and things unrelated to um, the effusion that was present recently. When we look at um, a tits, kind of our standard emittance measurement tympanometry and we compare, say, a partial effusion to a full effusion, particularly given the difference in hearing loss between the two, what we find is that they really do not differ on our standard emittance measurements at all. So this is just an example case of a child who had um, a partial mucoid effusion on the right side and a full effusion on the left side, and their tips were identical. And we see this repeatedly over and over that um, whether it's full or partial, we often see flat type B tympanograms. Um, then we looked at otoacoustic emissions, which a lot of people don't measure um, if you have a flat tympanogram or evidence of otitis media with effusion, but it's something we were just curious 
um, what they would look like. And so what I'm showing here is a cross frequency to signal to noise ratio of these OAEs. And so here you see the normal um, years on the top with the triangles, and they have what we kind of expect for OAEs um, in these young children. And then the clear ears, you can see kind of the signal to noise ratio is reduced. So their amplitudes are reduced or closer to the noise across the board. Um, the partial effusions are reduced even further, and ultimately the full effusions are pretty much in the noise. So we often think about um, an OAE being present if it has at least a signal to noise ratio of six. So if we were to draw a line here, you could see that in most cases, all the full ears have no OAEs present. The partial ears, which are kind of interesting, would often show at least one or two um, present autoacoustic emissions, often in kind of this four to five um, kilohertz range. Um, also, what's kind of interesting about the OAE data is that it is different from the hearing loss data because those clear and partial ears do separate out. So we see a larger effect of a partial effusion on otoacoustic emissions as opposed to hearing. And what we think is going on there is that the otoacoustic emissions um, are influenced by both the forward and reverse transmission. And so they have to go through the middle ear twice, right? And so they kind of get a double whammy of anything going on in the middle ear, whereas hearing is only we're kind of concerned with that forward transmission into the inner ear. And last but not least, looking at our wideband acoustic emittance measurement. So what I'm plotting first is all the individual data of all the ears with OME. And what um, I hope jumps out to you here is that there's a lot of variability. And at first that might seem like, oh, well, this is not a very helpful tool for OME, then it's all over the place. But what's great about that variability is that I think that's telling us something very meaningful about how much variability there is in otitis media um, on auditory mechanics. If we take all of this data and actually then separate it out by the volume of the effusion, we see very consistent effects. So we see a very consistent kind of reduction in absorbance across frequency with full effusions. And as you can see, kind of as the amount of effusion um, decreases, the absorbance tracing kind of improves. And we see a larger, I kind of think about it like an area under the curve. Um, and so given that, um, you know, all the, this variability exists here, if you get a tracing that looks kind of really low across the board, you may be able to infer, okay, well, that's you know likely to be a more full effusion versus a partial effusion. Mm -hmm. And in fact, that's what we were interested in. So as an audiologist, I don't see groups of patients, like this group level data was very exciting to me, um, but I wanna know like if an individual patient comes in and I run one measurement, like is that alone gonna be telling? And so what we did is we took all the individual tracings and we put them in a machine learning algorithm. So we trained the algorithm on 70% of the data and then used the remaining 30% of the data as test data. So the model hadn't seen it and said, tell me which ear is full, which ear is partial, which ear is clear, which ear is a normal control. And so first you can see all the individual data that went to the model plotted kind of um, with the mean. And so I do think the group level mean data does represent the individual data quite well. Um, and what's interesting is if we look at kind of the sensitivity and specificity and the way we did this, we ran this um, many, many times with different kind of variations of 70, 30. Um, and when we do that, that's why these numbers are so high. We get just kind of distinguishing, is there a fusion present or absent? So can you distinguish fluid or not fluid? We get an accuracy of about 95% with a sensitivity and specificity also of 95%, which is significantly higher than kind of a fusion present versus absent for what's been reported for standard tympanometry, which usually is in kind of the mid 80%. Um, interestingly to me has always been this distinguishing, distinguishing between those full ears and those partial ears. Um, because the hearing is so different in those cases. And so we then looked, could we distinguish these two with this machine learning algorithm? And we were able to do that with pretty high sensitivity and specificity as well, 89% accuracy. Distinguishing the clear and normal ears has been more challenging. They are much more similar. And so we get more moderate accuracy. That said, I think clinically, that's probably the least interesting comparison. And so we weren't too discouraged by that. We've also been trying to improve these um, sensitivity and specificities even further. And so I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail for the sake of time, um, but we've been kind of taking these wideband measurements and applying them to a computational model that basically lets us remove the effect of the ear canal so that we can really look at look the characteristics of what's happening in the middle ear. And that does kind of that computational modeling approach does seem to improve our sensitivity and specificity in some cases. And we're kind of continuing to work on refining that model and figuring out what parameters of these measurements might um, be the most diagnostically sensitive to different things. <laughs>
So kind of to summarize this section, unlike standard tympanometry, these absorbance tracings do show a lot of promise in predicting how much fluid is in the middle ear. And so this is that same kiddo who had tymps that looked identical in the two ears with the partial effusion in one ear and the full effusion on the left side. And you can see, even though the tymps are identical, how different the wideband absorbance tracings are. And just because I always find case studies interesting, these are just a couple other cases that kind of compare these kind of standard metrics we're used to looking at with the absorbance metrics. This is actually an interesting case. I had a colleague um, who has a late talker. He's about three and a half. Um, and he was diagnosed with acute otitis media. And she said, oh, can I bring him upstairs? So I said, sure. And the first thing I do is run a temp on his right ear. Um, and that was the ear that was diagnosed with AOM. And I see this very rounded um, temp. And I ran it like three times. And so it was clear that it wasn't normal, but I see a lot of mobility um, in that measurement. So then I ran otoacoustic emissions because we do that in the lab um, for all our OME kids and, um, and there were no OEEs. And I got a little worried because when we see this much mobility in a temp, typically in this population, um, I see a lot of OAEs usually present. But then I ran the absorbance tracing and it was very low and reduced across all frequencies. And so that's more consistent with an ear that's pretty chock full of fluid. And interestingly, you do see a little bit more of low frequency mobility even in the absorbance tracing, which is why we're probably seeing it here, um, which does seem to be characteristic more of acute otitis media as opposed to otitis media with effusion. So we're investigating that a little bit further. But this made me a lot more confident in the OAE result of absent OAEs. I was starting to get worried that maybe some of his late talker -ness, um, was because there was some undiagnosed sensory neural hearing loss there. And as it turns out, that was not the case. And we've seen him since. And then this is his left ear, which just had pretty negative pressure, but beautiful OAEs across the board. Um, and we're able to look at both kind of an ambient tracing and a pressurized tracing. And so the ambient tracing um, kind of is affected by that negative pressure. And so you see a reduction, um, particularly at the low frequencies because of an in increase in stiffness. But you see that red tracing there is when we compensate for that by looking at tympanometric peak pressure and the absorbance pretty much normalizes at that point. So there's no fluid in this ear, it's just pressure. And then this is a sequential set of data from the same kiddo. And so we saw her um, a couple of weeks apart. Um, and so you can see abnormal temps type B, pretty absent um, OEs across the board. There's that one that pops up, which often happens if we have kind of a borderline partial effusion. And here's the wideband tracings. You can see the red ear, the right ear is a little bit better, which is probably why we're getting a little bit of sound transmission there. Um, came back again, visit two flat temps. So the temps are kind of telling the same story, but now beautiful OAEs um, from like three kilohertz up in both ears and a much improved absorbance tracing. So though the temps don't demonstrate any improvement, um, the OAEs and the absorbance both kind of clearly tell us that this ear is improving between these two visits. Um, and so I think uh, this adds a lot of sensitivity to kind of knowing how a child is doing um, that we don't see kind of in these standard and men's measurements. So why have we been excited about these data? If you think back to that kind of first plot of data that I shared about the hearing loss, we do see that volume of effusion seems to drive a lot of the hearing loss in this population. Um, and we know that understanding how these children are hearing, especially on an ear specific level, might be useful in how we manage and think about management, whether we're deciding to continue to wait it out or maybe proceed towards um, considering two placement. It's also kind of interesting, for, more interesting for me, probably highly related to any sort of long-term behavioral outcomes that we're interested in. Um, and so you might say, well, just test their hearing at all these visits then. But um, as you likely know, testing hearing, particularly in the age range where OME is most common, is really challenging. So two-year-olds are like notoriously hard to um, test. And sometimes we can get some sound field data, but that's not telling us about um, how the individual ears are hearing. And so you could have a child with completely normal hearing in one ear that's going to look beautiful on sound field audiology measurements um, and have, you know, quite a bit of hearing loss in the other ear. And while that might be sufficient for speech and language development, things like binaural processing, listening and noise, localizing sound are all going to um, be impacted by a hearing loss like that. So if we had an easy metric to give us more insight into how a child's hearing, we can't get behavioral measures um, I think that would be pretty valuable. And, you know, the wideband tracings suggest that we could infer, you know, okay, well, this is a full effusion. They're likely hearing in that moderate um, hearing loss range. This was actually handy. Personally, I brought my son in Grayson um, for a study on rotary chair norms um, with a colleague of mine, Kristen Jenke. And so these were for kids with normal auditory function. And so we're running temps to rule out middle ear dysfunction. So she runs the temps and they're flat. And I have no idea. I'm bad mom audiologist, I think, because 
my child clearly has fluid and I had no idea that that was happening. Um, but then we quickly ran the wideband um, response and it was clear to me that he had at best probably partial effusions in both ears, which meant he's probably hearing okay, um, which is why I haven't noticed anything with him. Although we all know that OME often goes undiagnosed for long periods of time, but it made the mom audiologist in me a little relieved that I wasn't totally overlooking it. Um, he still went to go see or ENT, but um, uh, you know, just that big difference in kind of how these absorbance tracings look can give us a lot of insight into how a child is hearing. Um, and this is also just an interesting case that I thought I'd share in particular with this group about how these wideband tracings in this population are also helpful even when you have some behavioral audiometric information. So this was an eight-year-old who was seen in clinic for suspected OM. Um, in clinic, they had bilateral flat timps and this bilateral conductive hearing loss. Um, and so we went from audiology to ENT and our um, ENT couldn't visualize fluid. He actually, I pulled up the note and said on otologic exam, I thought the middle ear was aerated. My research audiologist was in clinic that day recruiting. Um, and he looked at Sarah and said, can the temps be wrong? Like, I just, I don't think this is what's going on. And she's like, oh. so they sent him back to audiology despite being pretty confident that these temps were right. Um, and he said, we repeated his tympanogram flat again. And so he said, well, he's had hearing loss identified over the last six months. You hear hooves, you think horses, not zebras. So they assumed it had to be fluid, um, even though he couldn't visualize it and scheduled him for two placement and they enrolled in our study. So we saw him um, the night before surgery. So again, kind of very atypical tympanogram. So if you look really closely, I can see some evidence of mobility in that left tympanogram, but would certainly still be classified as you know, a type B, um, but what largely present otoacoustic emissions in that left ear and even one in the right ear. And we don't see this many OAEs with kids with that much hearing loss typically. And then when I did the absorbance tracings, you can see that, especially if you think about it again, as that area under the curve, there's quite a bit of area under both curves, which would suggest pretty aerated middle ears, um, which is not consistent with this much hearing loss. And so I immediately think this kiddo does not have fluid, like there's something else going on here. And then I left when I looked back at the note and realized that um, our ENT also didn't think there was fluid. Um, and ultimately, um, we blind our ENT to all of these data typically, but I unblinded him that morning of surgery because I was pretty convinced that this child was going to have tubes placed and that wasn't what was going on. Um, and they did decide to cancel the surgery. And what we suspect is not that he has, you know, an, a fusion that's causing that much hearing loss, but I'm more suspicious that he has kind of a congenital fixation. So these are just some data of normal ears compared to ears with otosclerosis. And you see that you still get an atypical absorbance tracing, but it's primarily in the low frequencies because of the stiffness effect. Um, and so you can see quite a bit of, of hearing loss in otosclerosis with a smaller shift um, in the absorbance with these fixations. And so um, unfortunately, this family moved. I was really, we were going to get them imaged and um, they moved to Michigan. So I don't actually know the resolution to this case, but um, I still find it pretty interesting that even it was actually the hearing loss data that kind of gave us some pause that things didn't match up. So a lot of this rests on the idea that um, assessment of behavioral audiometry is challenging in otitis media. And we got some pushback on that um, in some of our grant applications. And so we decided to actually quantify this. And so what we found, um, in, at least in our population at Boys Town, which I think is, if anything, probably going to be um, on the more successful end of things, because we have a lot of really skilled pediatric audiologists and a lot of resources at our disposal at kind of this specialty tertiary center. Um, and so what we found is that in kids under five with OME that we've seen in both the lab and in clinic, that in clinic, they got absolutely no behavioral audiometric information in 20% of those cases. And that in 53%, they only got information in the sound field. So nothing ear specific. And in the majority of those, that was just one sound awareness threshold. So you're really not getting a big idea about how these children are hearing, let alone how they're ear hearing on an ear specific level. So we're only getting ear specific information of some variety in 20% of ears. And it's only kind of that four frequency peer tone average in about 15% of cases. We did compare that kind of our success in the lab, which seems to be a bit higher um, 
likely because we have even more time and resources and we aren't limited by kind of clinic schedules. Um, but even still with kind of every resource at our disposal, we're only getting a four frequency period down average in 34% of years. And again, we do think that that ear specific information is particularly useful because we know that the two ears can be very different with otitis media with effusion. So a lot of our kids that we've been following have very different presentations in the two ears, very different hearing. Um, and so that sound field data could miss hearing loss in one ear. And we also think that how the two ears are working together while kind of hearing well in one ear might be sufficient for kind of speech and language development, vocabulary, things like that. Um, hearing and noise, binaural processing, localization, all of these other things are likely very influenced by how both ears are hearing. And so we're really interested in um, understanding kind of how that uh, deficits in hearing in one ear versus the other might be influencing these processes. In contrast, in that same group of kids, we looked at we were able to get wideband in all of them, and we were able to get it in 96% of kids. So there's always that, you know, kiddo or two who has that history of ear infections. They don't want you anywhere near their ears or touching them. Um, but by and large, we're able to successfully get this measure in the vast majority of kids. Um, and so if we could have that kind of um, information about how 96% of kids are hearing on an ear specific level versus, you know, 25%, I think that would kind of fill a significant gap just in the knowledge base that you have to then decide how you're managing these patients. And so we're now taking this a step further, you know, so instead of saying, oh, I'm looking at an absorbance tracing, it looks full, so they probably have this moderate conductive hearing loss. Could we directly infer, kind of take that effusion volume out of the equation and just directly infer their hearing from these um, mechanical wideband measurements? And so what we did here is we took each individual tracing like this and averaged it across all of those data points to down to one number. And admittedly, I thought this first pass of this would be terrible, but I was like, it's a first pass. I'm curious what this will look like. So I took that average absorbance, that single number characterizing this curve and compared it to the average air bone gap in ears where we had really good mast bone and mast air across kind of 500, 1,000, 2,000, and 4,000 Hertz and plotted those two here. And what you see is that you do see this trend of effusion volume. So as the um, effusion volume increases, we see decreasing average absorbance, but that even more strongly, what you see is this kind of very tight correlation between the average absorbance and the average air bone gap. And so as the average absorbance decreases, we see kind of a very systematic increase um, in the average air bone gap. And so based on this, we do suspect that we will be able to kind of take that volume of effusion out of the equation and really just use these um, wideband measurements to directly estimate con conductive hearing loss from them. And so our goal is to kind of to develop um, a wideband acoustic estimate of conductive hearing loss within about three to five dB, which is what we consider test retest reliability, um, or maybe even better in some cases than test retest reliability um, for behavioral audiometry. And we are applying that same computational modeling approach that I described earlier. And so again, kind of without going into too much detail on that, what you can see is we um, are kind of getting within that 5 dB with our preliminary um, methods to predict hearing loss um, as compared to um, their actual hearing um, in our group of kids so far. So kind of in the future, what we hope to do is to create kind of a machine learning algorithm where um, an audiologist could run an absorbance tracing and it could spit out, we think this is a full effusion with a certain kind of pure tone average um, or a partial effusion with a certain kind of pure tone average. And I think this will make interpreting these wideband tracings um, much more simple and uh, more efficient. And we're also kind of developing some uh, schematics, infographics, um, that I think clinics could use with some text, even without a machine learning GUI um, that says like, this is what a normal tracing looks like, clear, partial, and full, and kind of how that corresponds with um, what we would expect for their hearing as well. So that's um, the bulk of what I wanted to share today with the little bit of time I have left. I just wanted to talk about kind of a, a new direction that we've been going in the last year. So all the data I've shared today is about how do they look at this one time point when we see them in clinic? And I think that um, improving kind of how we're able to estimate their hearing loss at these visits and such on a single time point is helpful, um, but it still doesn't tell us anything about long-term outcomes, how much auditory deprivation they've had over time and or what the trajectory of these um, episodes are. It doesn't tell us whether we can predict a fusion that's gonna clear versus persist. Um, and so we've been really curious also about kind of the longitudinal um, nature of these um, episodes. 
And so we have started monitoring kids that we are enrolling using some mobile research resources. And so we bring them ideally into the lab for that same initial test battery that we've already discussed, but then we monitor their middle ear status weekly using otoscopy, tympanometry, wideband acoustic events, and OAEs in a mobile van. And so these are just some pictures. So this was a mobile van that was previously used for language research, so very much not set up for auditory testing, but we've kind of made the best of it. Um, and when we turn kind of the air and the heat off for a few minutes, we can get really reasonable noise floors for these type of measures. We can even do behavioral audiometry in there because we have these um, headphones that have nice passive attenuation. And so we're able to kind of bring this to kiddos' homes and they just kind of run out into the van. And so we're able to do these 15, 20 minute visits um, weekly in a way that we're able to kind of retain all these participants where I don't think we'd be able to do that if we were asking them to come into the lab every single week. Um, and this has been quite successful so far. We actually just, with some recent funding from a new R01, designed a new van that's much more conducive to um, our auditory testing. And I can't really move around a child very easily um, in this van. And so we've had to get very strategic about how to place the probe. And there's a lot of, um, you know, tripping over each other. And so we have just a lot more space and room to move about here. Um, we have a monitor. We might be able to do some visual reinforcement audiometry, which we can't do in the other van. So we're pretty excited about that. And we have so much data on these kids. So I'm not going to kind of bore you with all of that, but just to give you an idea of the type of data we can get with this type of monitoring protocol. So this is just one of our control participants. So you see nice temps, normal hearing, nice wideband, nice OAEs, and we go back a week later and a few weeks later. And so we're going back every week, but you can see we're able to see this consistently normal um, auditory status across all these visits, which is great. The wideband is very consistent across all of them. Actually, it's been interesting in so many of our controls, we do find incidental um, kind of middle ear dysfunction periodically in a lot of them that parents had no idea about. So it's actually hard to find normative controls that don't have middle ear dysfunction in this age range um, more than we even thought it would be. And then this is one of our kiddos with OME. And so you can see pretty abnormal tympanometry there, but some um, otoacoustic emissions on each side and absorbance tracings that were more consistent with a partial effusion. Um, and so uh, they were partial at this first visit. We go back about a week later and you see still flat temps. Um, the OAEs are actually a little bit better and it's hard to tell, but the green tracings are the wideband tracings from the week before. And so we see a little bit of improvement and the absorbance, even though the temps are still very abnormal. And actually, if you compare the OAEs, there was um, a little bit of improvement in the OAEs as well. So we're very slowly, it seems trending towards normal a week later. And then three weeks later, so she was kind of persistently getting better. And then the kind of visit right before she was having tubes placed, we went back, temps are still flat, but the OAEs are now abolished and the absorbance is the poorest of all the visits we've seen. And so you can see it in green, or excuse me, in blue and red here as compared to green, which was um, the pri prior week. And what happened is she actually got acute otitis media um, right before surgery. Um, and that's why you see kind of the auditory status get much poorer. But what I think is interesting is even though the temps are more or less telling us the same story at all of these visits, the absorbance and the OAEs are kind of telling us a very different story. And then this is just a kiddo who had very different um, hearing between the two ears. So some negative pressure in the left ear, but norm pretty normal hearing, maybe a little effect of the negative pressure at the lows, but beautiful OAEs in contrast to the right ear, which had a full effusion. We go back about a week later and that right ear is now improved. So we see improved hearing, we see some present OAE. So it's still probably a partial effusion, but we're on the trajectory of getting better. Um, and then we go back a week later and it's actually gotten a little bit worse. So we see the hearing has declined a little bit um, and the absorbance tracing has gone down a bit and now there's no OAEs. Um, and so my take home here is one, there's just a lot of variability. There's a lot of changes that are happening even in this week time frame. but how sensitive these absorbance tracing are to kind of what I consider these subtle changes in middle ear status associated with OME, but that are also associated with subtle changes in hearing that we think are therefore meaningful. So just some key takeaways. Um, I think these wideband measurements show really strong potential in differentiating volume of an effusion, which can't be set up kind of our traditional metrics. Um, and this is significant because this, this volume also seems to be driving how much conductive hearing loss is present. Um, and we actually think that our preliminary data suggests that we might be able to directly predict um, kind of the pure tone average conductive hearing loss in children with OME to give an ear specific estimate of hearing 
which is particularly useful in kids where we don't have any behavioral information or ear specific behavioral information. Um, these measurements are feasible um, in infants and in toddlers of all ages, um, and also seem sensitive to these kind of um, subtle changes in middle ear mechanics that are associated with changes in hearing. So it could be useful for monitoring middle ear status um, over time. And so with that, I just want to thank um, the members of my lab, in particular, my research audiologist, so Sarah Alsalim, as well as um, I have two audiologists that work part-time in research and part-time in clinic, and that's immensely useful for our recruitment, Jane and Leah, um, and Rick Tempero, who is an otolaryngologist and scientist at Boyson, who's been working with me since I opened the lab, and um, is a big part of all of this work, along with research assistants and our funding and some collaborators. And with that, I'm super happy to take questions and I wanted to put a shameless plug in here, just not knowing who exactly would be in this audience, but Creighton who um, is just across the bridge from us is looking to hire a founding chair in otolaryngology. Um, I think it's a really exciting position. Um, they would like them to start a residency program in otolaryngology here. And we're hoping that this person will want to collaborate um, with the very active auditory and vestibular hearing science community here, both at Boys Town and at Creighton. And so if you know anyone who might be interested in moving to Omaha um, and interesting at a founding chair position, please feel free to share that information.